Good evening, residents of Everett, Washington. I would like to call to order the Everett City Council meeting of April 13th, 2022. The council is conducting our weekly city council meeting remotely, but we are preparing to reopen the council chambers to public meetings at our regularly scheduled meeting on Wednesday, May 4th. So I hope some members of our community will join us that evening. In the meantime, there are several ways in which you can engage with the council and participate in our meetings. To watch or participate in the remote meeting, you may watch live on Comcast Channel 21 or Frontier Channel 29. You may watch live online at www.everettwa.gov backslash city council, where you may also watch past meetings. You may call in and listen to the live meeting at any point by dialing 425-616-3920. The conference ID is 724-887-726 pound. You may find the public comment registration form on the City of Everett website under City Council Department. Once you select the register here to provide comment via Zoom link, you will need to fill out the form completely and uh, submit that to provide public comment. Um, once you have that submitted, you'll receive an email confirmation with the Zoom link and the phone number to the meeting. And participants must submit this form at least 30 minutes prior to the council meeting. If it is submitted after that time, you will not receive the Zoom link and number to speak, but may still participate the day of the meeting by submitting comments in writing to council at everettwa.gov. For assistance with this, please contact the city council office at 425-257-8703, or you may email Deb Williams at dwilliams at everettwa.gov. Please note that we do not allow comments on any kind of campaigning, whether for or against ballot measures or candidates running for office. We also do not accept comments focused on personal matters that are unrelated to city business. Outside of our meetings, members of the public are always welcome to contact council members or provide comments or concerns on any matter via email at council at everettwa.gov or by calling the city council office. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Mayor Franklin? Here. Council member Tui? Here. Council member Ryan? Here. Council member Schwab? Here. Council member Fossey? Here. Council member Zarlingo? Here. Council member Vogley? <laughs> President Stonecipher? Here. I'd like to ask Council member Tui to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation under god, god indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all thank you and council member Fosti, would you please uh read the land acknowledgement thank you we acknowledge the original inhabitants of this place the shahobes people and their successors the Tulalip tribes since time immemorial, they have hunted, fished, gathered on, and taken care of these lands and waters. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and water. We will strive to be honest about our past mistakes and bring about a future that includes their people, stories, and voices to form a more just and equitable society. Thank you. Do I hear a motion for approval of the minutes of April 13th, 2022? Nope, I'm sorry, not April 13th. That would be April 6th. Council member Tui makes a motion to accept the, the minutes of April 6th. Do I hear a second? Council member Schwab second. We have a motion and a second. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council member Tui? Yes. Council member Ryan? Yes. Council member Schwab? Yes. Council member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. And good evening, Mayor Franklin. Yeah, good evening, Council President, Council Members. I'm asking for your support for two appointments to our 
Historical Commission. Uh, for position seven, Teresa Gemmer for a six-year term, and for position eight, Ashley Bush for a six-year term. Do I hear a motion? I move the motion to accept the mayor's two recommendations. Seconded. We have a motion and a second. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council member Tui? Yes. Council member Ryan? Yes. Council member Schwab? Yes. Council member Fossey? Yes. Council member Zarlingo? Yes. Council member Vogley? Yes. <laughs> Stone Cipher? Yes. Thank you. With that, I don't have any further comments this evening. Thanks. Thank you. And before we move on to council comments and liaison reports, I just want to report that I will be unable to attend next week's meeting on April 20th and council member Tui has agreed to chair the meeting. Deb Williams is also out that day. So we have administration uh, helping us manage that meeting. Also wanted to let my council colleagues know that because we passed our procedures last week, the election of the council vice president will appear on the agenda for the April 27th council meeting. And I will be sending you instructions for how that nomination and election process will unfold. I'll send that via email. Uh, now let's move on to council comments and liaison reports, starting with council member Ryan. Did you maybe want to start with council member Chewy? I do not have council member Tui up first. <laughs> okay, happy to go. <laughs> Um, thanks, everybody. Good to see you folks today. Um, just a short update for me. I had a chance to attend the uh, Port Garner Neighborhood Association meeting on Monday, and uh, they're resuming their meetings, which is really exciting. So uh, Port Garner is meeting on the second Monday of every month at 7 p.m. at the Sequoia High School cafeteria. And I believe they don't meet in August or December. Uh, August is their uh, national night out uh, meeting that they'll be having. So uh, it's great to see everybody there. Uh, Liz Stenning from the um, from the Downtown Everett Association gave a presentation and I was just really impressed with the great work that they do downtown to keep downtown clean. They have a whole crew of people that uh, get downtown at 430 in the morning uh, to clean up graffiti and pick up cigarette butts and other um, unmentionables. And uh, they do a really great job just to keep downtown a, a clean space for folks. And from the reminder that they have planting day coming up on April 30th. And so it's posted on the DEA Facebook page or it's on my council Facebook page as well. So I hope folks can join. Uh, they have start times at uh, 10, 11, and noon uh, to plant in the big planters that are in the downtown area. And if you're not able to make it, you can always adopt a pot uh, and uh, keep a pot green through the planting season, I think, into the uh, later fall time. So uh, it's always exciting. Uh, and there's just a number of really amazing events coming to downtown Everett this summer that I'm really excited about. And um, there's also a few other uh, local organizations that are that have events coming up, including Historic Everett. They have a number of walking tours. They had one on Sunday of Colby and they have another one coming up on May 14th, I believe through the cemetery. And um, there was also an update at the, count, at the neighborhood meeting a reminder to check on your emergency uh, food and supplies in case the big earthquake happens. So just double checking uh, what you have and to make sure that you have what you need. And um, but yeah, it was really great to be back at the uh, Port Garner Neighborhood Association. It's my uh, my neighborhood, so it was uh, good to see folks. And um, and most neighborhoods do have council meetings, so check the Council of Neighborhood websites for when uh, your neighborhood meets and uh, get involved with the local community. Uh, last, I had a chance to join the Arbor Day celebration uh, with Everett Parks at Wiggum's Hollow Park uh, today, and uh, there are some kiddos from Hawthorne Elementary that joined to help plant some trees at the park, so always happy to participate in increasing our tree canopy, so it was great to be there, and uh, great to see folks at the event and all the hands that went in to help plant the new trees, so that's it for me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilmember Schwab. I have no report. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fossey. Thanks. Um, I wanted to give uh, a thank you to Councilmember Zarlingo for uh, heading over to the Riverside meeting. I'm sure he'll report on that. Um, last week, uh, we had the Puget Sound Regional Council Growth Management Policy Board. Um, they gave you know the basic 
legislative updates that we've kind of heard a little bit and talked a little bit about the potential grants um, that may be available for all of us um, in the budgets for our, our periodic updates. Um, and then uh, I heard that there was a Smart Communities Award. The nominations are open for that. I know uh, Lake Stevens um, and uh, North Bend uh, had gotten it last time. I don't know if we're, we're applying for that, um, but that is coming up and those are open until about uh, May 6th. Um, we voted to certify um, the Canyon Park um, sub area plan and uh, the Snohomish County citywide planning um, policy, I believe, but that's going to the transportation policy board next month or later this month. Uh, they did a really interesting update on some Puget Sound uh, data trends um, and uh, traffic volumes are within 5% of pre pandemic volumes. Uh, but uh, transit is ridership is still pretty low um, at half. And so um, that it was kind of uh, revealing retail sales are up 13% um, over 2019. Uh, so that's um, it's just a lot of interesting data they they uh, presented uh, after the, you know, what we've been going through with the pandemic and whatnot. Um, with uh, the Cultural Arts Commission uh, meeting, um, just a reminder that uh, the uh, mayor, the Wentz Award is uh, May 12th. And uh, today we had, uh, last thing was our um, first planning committee meeting. Um, it was pretty standard stuff. We're going to have the standing uh, issues of the comp plan and um, talking about the light rail expansion. Uh, and so we'll have um, probably more updates next month um, after that meeting, but that's all I have today. Thank you, uh, Council Member Zarlingo. Uh, well, as uh, uh, Council Member Fossey said, I attended uh, the Riverside neighborhood uh, meeting last night. That was uh, that was fun. A good chance to see a different neighborhood. You know, to, to make the most of our districted uh, arrangements. Now, I think some cross pollination between the districts will help us uh, get the best of both worlds that way. And I've uh, talked with uh, Council Member Fossey and uh, one of the neighborhood representatives there about walking the neighborhood because that's not one I have been in much before. So I look forward to the chance to do that. Some, some fun folks and a chance to learn. Um, and also, as uh, Council Member Fossey said, thanks to her for organizing. Uh, she's the chair of the planning committee here of the council. Uh, learned a lot today. And so thanks to her for organizing that and for the staff for a great presentation that made the most of the hour, the full hour, plus a couple of minutes that we that we had today. Um, let's see. Uh, in terms of uh, meetings, tomorrow is the Transportation Policy Board meeting for the Puget Sound Regional Council. This is a second meeting for the um, uh, for their big plan. The first meeting was a two-hour meeting. Tomorrow's is a three and a half hour meeting going through all of the amendments there for the Regional Transportation Plan and hoping to make some good suggestions there also with some good instructions feedback from the mayor and from her staff. So thanks to them for that. Uh, let's see, we had a meeting of the Joint Policy Committee for possible consolidation of Everett Transit and Community Transit. Uh, looking forward there, uh, you know, with longer commutes and high fuel prices and higher density we'll be facing in the future, transit's going to need to improve and adapt. And how we do that is the question uh, before us, how we can try to improve transit service levels and be more efficient uh, with the limited dollars we have. Um, and also adapting to eventual sound transit. A couple of years coming to Linwood and then coming to Everett. Some years after that, uh, we'll be looking into consolidation. There are lots of complicating factors here, uh, looking to dig deeply into that. Um, if it looks like it makes sense, then the Board of Community Transit, uh, the council will vote to have the Board of Community Transit uh, put that before voters. So in the end, it will be the voters who, who uh, look at the package describing benefits and costs and decide uh, yay or nay. Uh, and lastly, the Board of Health, the meeting yesterday, a uh, report from the health officer, uh, Dr. Spitters, uh, generally good news, low rates in the schools and long-term care continue. So we haven't seen an uptick that way, but in the broader population, there is something of an uptick as this B2 variant takes over. Uh, fortunately, uh, that is not increased hospitalization or deaths. So um, I think we're sort of handling this as a population and with, vaccinations and boosting and immunity from some infections, we're achieving, I guess, a kind of herd immunity, although I don't think Dr. Spitters used that word yesterday. Um, 
that's it now. We'll all continue to be careful. If we can keep these bumps down, then hopefully we can have a more normal summer and fall. And that's all for me. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Vogley. we go. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I went to the Westmont Holly Neighborhood Association and Kat Soper was there and gave a presentation about all the awesome things that are happening at the port. So that's cool. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about red light cameras, of course, the golf courses and how they are being productive. Um, and the need for shade and all sorts of things at uh, Walter Hall Park, which I think those of you who have been there know all about that. Um, there was, I just want to put out there that a member of the community was concerned about 10th Avenue West and West Casino. I think uh, law enforcement and people that live there know exactly where I'm talking about, but a lot of the same types of things that are happening downtown are happening off, off offshoots of streets uh, off of West Casino Road and in my neck of the woods. So um, it was it was a pretty chatty conversation, honestly. And um, I'm just putting that out there. So things are still happening and. Uh, we need housing and services and all of that. And that's what we're working towards. So thank you, team. Um, and uh, let's see, one of you, I think Council Member Fossey mentioned the traffic and all of that. And I would just like to say that we had a collision at 4th and Holly between two vehicles. I almost got hit as a pedestrian in a walk signal. A friend of mine later told me that they had almost gotten hit that day in a crosswalk. Um, car just blasted through a stop sign. I know all of you are seeing this all the time. Um, and we've had four pedestrian deaths uh, with cars being the killer. Well, yeah. So please be aware of your surroundings. Oh yeah, and then I saw another person, you know, practically run into a pedestrian. So um, when you're driving your car, like I also drive my car, just be safe, you know, look out. People do use the roads that aren't in cars. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Tui. Thank you, Council President. So uh, we had our housing and homelessness meeting this past uh, week, and Julie uh, staff uh, provided a great update on some some of the major projects that were work that they're working on with the ARPA funds and um, uh, so the first one is the uh, pallet um, expansion at the Everett Gospel Mission with um, adding additional case management, 20 new pallets and two bathrooms in common space. So they're working on that. I'm not sure when that exact timeline is on that. They're also uh, working on um, a possible new site for transitional housing for women and children which would be awesome and great and needed. Um, and then also we talked about, uh, which is further down the road, case management project for mental health and behavioral support. Uh, there's some, a project out there. And then uh, we also talked about alternative response with behavioral health responders, different programs and models that are out there that are actually working. And so uh, it was great to have that information forwarded. So it was, it's very, very informational. Um, I think Julie and her team are doing a great job on really doing the, the homework and the back work that needs to happen on all these programs. So those were, that was a great meeting. And I also attended the Port Gardner Bay uh, neighborhood meeting as my neighborhood. So it was great to get there, even though I couldn't find them for quite a while, <laughs> they moved, but uh, it was great to be there. And I look forward to, um, going to other neighborhood meetings so anyway that's all i have thank you thank you and uh for my liaison report i just wanted to announce that i too attended the joint policy committee um on ever transit and community transit uh discussions we had a lot of great information today i thought it was very helpful to get a nice overview of community transit and all the services they do. I guess we just don't realize how much bigger of an agency they are than than our Everett Transit. 
So uh, lots of work to do at that um, organizing committee as well over the next year and a half. Um, so we'll have something from them probably about this time next year. That's all I have. So we'll move uh, to administration. Is there an update from administration this evening? Just one up, update. Good evening, council members. I wanted to share tonight a brief summary of information that will be sent to council in the coming days regarding the recently signed move ahead Washington transportation package. It includes unprecedented direct fund, unprecedented, excuse me, direct funding to public transportation. To be able to access these funds, transit agencies must adopt a fare free policy for all customers 18 years and younger by October 1st of this year. So it's 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 on a fast pace. A change in the fare ordinance requires a public information and comment process, public hearing before council and ultimately council approval. Uh, we'd also like to take the opportunity to address some other timely issues in terms of our current fair policy. So additional information will be provided to council just within the next couple of days on that. Uh, we wanna get the public input process going. And uh, certainly if there are more questions after that information is provided, we're happy to come back to council sooner or uh, we can wait till the public input process has been completed, um, either one. So please take a look at that when you get a chance. Um, thank you. And there are no other updates tonight. Thank you. We'll move on to city attorney, Mr. Hall. What do you have for us this evening? I don't have anything to report tonight, but we are requesting a 40 minute executive session to discuss four litigation matters pursuant to RCW 4230-110-1I with potential council action to follow on one of those matters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I will ask Deb Williams, have we received any comments from the community for public comment tonight? Good evening, President Stonecipher. We have received no written comment. I have one person signed up to speak. When I call your name, please turn on your camera if possible, unmute yourself and give your name and city for the record. Please remember to limit your comments to 30 minutes, pardon me, to three minutes, excuse me. At 30 <laughs> seconds, I will ask you to wrap up. Mr. Joe Rizkowski, go ahead, please. There we go. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. I'm sorry. I'm not very good at this. Uh, just to give a little bit of context, I placed the call to uh, 911 this, um, this last Monday. And um, because we have a number of homeless people setting up camp uh, right between the library and library place. And uh, I walked out at uh, 930 and the tents are all still up. And uh, so I call, called it in uh, and eventually it got taken care of. Um, but I wanted, uh, there was a number of our neighbors who talked about this and um, I've talked about it and been concerned. So I agreed that I would be part of it. It looks like I'm the only one. So that's okay. Uh, last month, my wife uh, told me that she no longer feels safe walking in our neighborhood. Uh, for 10 years, she has walked to her bakery in the middle of the night and in the early mornings, but now things have become much worse. I too feel uncomfortable walking our dog after dark with all the lurkers, the sleepers and the parked vehicles camped out around the library. I look behind me when I, uh, to see if I'm gonna get jumped. I don't take my wallet or valuables with me. I expect a confrontation every time I go out. Last month I watched in the middle of the day as two guys stood in front of the open library main entrance, hunkered together under a huge blanket in what looked like a sex act until I realized one of them was injecting something into the stomach area of a strung out friend. The kit was set out in the open for kids to see as they walked 
with their mothers by, you know, from their car to the library. I immediately pointed that out to the uh, library security who was standing on the library steps. But by then the dose had taken, you know, taken effect and the drugging was in La La Land. Uh, if I park more than 30 to 90 minutes outside my apartment, I risk getting a ticket. If my car is towed, I have to pay the towing company or risk losing my vehicle or my property. TSA takes unattended baggage left in public areas. And I'm telling, I bring this up because I think that this is a similar security and safety issue. If the city and the citizens don't find the political will to act, we're just enabling these people. They're no longer afraid and, and they are emboldened. It's that we are afraid and afraid to act. 18 months ago, the EPD cleaned out the encampment under Everett Avenue Bridge a couple times. I saw it. I just hope that you can make us believe that this wasn't a, a 21 uh, elect, election ploy that's going to get put on the shelf in 2022 for the next election cycle. Enforcement needs to include daily confiscating of stolen items, including those shopping carts. You need to find the businesses or anyone that leaves their dumpster unlocked or leaves items overnight in alleys that could be picked up or picked through. Carts left unattended for 30 minutes, those shopping carts, they should be hauled away. 30 seconds, uh, please. Stores need to reclaim their carts and city employees need to be given the tools and backed up by you. And uh, if this is a war on homelessness, you know, we can't, we can't lose this one. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your comments. President Stone Cipher, that is all I have this evening. Thank you, Deb. Uh, we are going to move on to our consent agenda. Do I hear a motion for the five consent items? <clears throat> Council member Tui moves the five consent items. Ogilvy seconds. We have a motion and a second for the consent agenda. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council member Tui? Yes. Council member Ryan? Yes. Council member Schwab? Yes. Council member Fossey? Yes. Council member Zarlingo? Yes. Council member Vogley? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. Uh, we have two items on for proposed action. They've been read into the record at a prior meeting. Do I have any questions this evening on the two proposed action items before we move on to our action agenda? Council member Vogley. It's a comment to our commenter. So not about the action items. I can okay. wait. Uh, go ahead, Will. Okay, Leave thank you. Um, thank you for calling and knowing that you called um, on behalf of a group was noted. And I know that there are many, many people having similar experiences uh, in all of our streets. I wanted to put out there, I think I've said it before, um, you know, what are some of the ways that we can fix this housing crisis? Um, we've spoken of a lot of them, and I'm wondering if um, safe injection sites might be something that you and your members would like to uh, converse about either over email or somewhere else. So I just, that's one thing, and I think the conversation should be started. And I heard you, and it looks like the mayor might want to talk to. Um, I, so, oh, yeah, council president, sorry, thank you. Yes, um, go ahead. I did send an email to our council. I, I, and I, to the uh, resident that um, shared his experience. You know, we're so sorry that's been your experience, and 
you are not alone. I've, I've heard uh, the concerns um, from, from folks like you that are living in our downtown that are not feeling safe due to um, illegal activity that's going on, um, especially late at night in, in, in our streets. And um, we have a number of things that we are working on to try to increase safety, but I want to be very clear, there is a lot that we cannot do. And that's nothing that this council or our administration has, has um, put into policy. It's state policies that are dictating what we can and cannot police or enforce. And to the open drug use that is so frustrating for so many of our residents and, and, and very dangerous and scary to witness, especially for children. Um, we are, uh, due to some decisions that have happened at the, uh, in, other, <laughs> um, uh, in other areas, the state now requires that we uh, uh, ask uh, or try to get people treatment multiple times before we can actually enforce against illegal drug activity, which uh, is hard for some of our residents that don't know that to understand. But when we see that happening, we actually cannot arrest that person. We have to offer drug treatment and services. And so as we work to do that with our outreach and enforcement team, our co-ed team, we are, we are working very hard to try to get people into services and support. But um, uh, there are, there are uh, laws and, and policies at higher levels of government that prohibit us from taking actions that we might have taken just a, a year or two ago. So um, with that, I, I did share a lot of information with the council as to some of the work that we have underway to increase safety and some of the work that we're working with with partners to try to um, move some of the services that are, are very disruptive to the downtown business community to a better service location for some of those services. And we'll look forward to keeping the council and our public posted as to our progress on uh, ensuring a safer, uh, walkable uh, area in our residential and downtown communities. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other council members who would like to comment on the public comment that we received? Council members are lingo. Um, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Ruskowski for his uh, for his comments, um, partly because I think it's important that one's genuine experiences and the breadth of those experiences are here in the public sphere. That'll help us uh, do the best we can. And I think raising the profile of the real experiences of all the different the different people in the involved in this will help make uh, better state laws and I think eventually uh, uh, help the courts as well. I'd like to thank the mayor for her efforts in this uh, because I think, um, you know, sharing these experiences is important, it's important for us to hear this. And I think it's important to, um, to help us navigate our way through some very, very thorny uh, and um, and almost contradictory uh, policies and restrictions to try to improve this problem. It's, it's not going away easily, but I really appreciate people taking the time to get involved and make those comments. Thank you. Anyone else care to respond to the public comment? Seeing none. Uh, and having no questions on the proposed action items, we'll move on to our action agenda. Uh, starting with item number eight, Council Bill 2203-11. This is the third and final reading. Adopt the proposed ordinance approving the appropriate, appropriates of the 2022 revised City of Everett budget and amending ordinance number 3838-21. Do I hear a motion? Councilmember Tui moves the motion on uh, action item number eight, the proposed ordinance approving the appropriate appropriates of the 2022 revised budget. Do I hear a second? Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Let's see if we have any questions or comments, starting with Councilmember Ryan. Uh, no questions. Just want to thank Susie uh, for all of her hard work to put all this together and keep track of every nickel and penny. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Schwab. No questions, thank you. Council Member Fossey. No questions or comments, thank you. Council Member Zarlingo. Nothing more for me, thanks. Council Member Vogley. No, thank you, got it. 
Council Member Tui. No questions or comments, thank you. And I have no questions or comments. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Tui? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Schwab? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. President Sonsifer? Yes. Item nine, waive a minor irregularity and award construction contract for the 2022 pavement maintenance overlay project to Central Paving LLC in the amount of $3,069,652.92. Do I hear a motion? The council members Arlingo uh, moves to waive the minor irregularity and award construction contract for the 2022 pavement maintenance overlay project to Central Paving LLC in the amount of $3,069,652.92. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Council All right, there we go. But can I spell mm -hmm. it out? Just kidding, sorry. We have a motion and a second. Let's see if we have questions or comments, starting with Council Member Ryan. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question for Tom Hood. I know we uh, emailed briefly about it today, but I was hoping to uh, finish the uh, what. It, so the map show one of the sections of the map shows federal uh, that's going to be repaved, but this is also part of the Fulton um, or not Fulton. The um, there's a bicycle lane that's going to be going through there eventually, and I'm completely blanking on the name right now. I apologize. And it's also going to be Jackson Elementary is going to be replaced uh, because of the levy that passed recently. So I'm, my concern is with this section, um, it's either going to be tore up by construction vehicles when the school goes under construction, or um, I want to make sure that the paving project also incorporates work that will be done because of that future bike lane that's going to be going through that area. So I just wanted to bring up those two concerns about that little section. I was hoping you could speak more to it. Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, Tom Hood, Public Works. Um, so the, um, the paving that is going to occur on federal as part of this project will be from uh, Charles Avenue south to 40th Street, which includes the frontage of Jackson Elementary. Um, the uh, the future bike lane will be additional um, work to the north of that, um, north from Charles up to 35th. And that portion of the roadway is not going to be overlaid with this contract because that is the current haul route being used by the Reservoir 2 construction site. Um, so when that, and, and so the, the pavement is obviously taking a beating from that haul route. So uh, at the end of that hauling, um, that section will likely be overlaid and then striped with the bike facility. Um, I think the, the bicycle facilities that you're referring to may be the Fleming Corridor, uh, which is coming up from the south uh, toward um, the overpass on Muckleteal Boulevard, and that will land uh, there at the south end. So the intent is to install um, bicycle sharrows uh, from there north to the Charles uh, terminus for the overlay contract. Great. So, is, so the the work won't be. So it is Fleming Street. Thank you. I pulled up Google Maps for the assist right during then too. Um, so there won't be. Um, a duplication of work for when those sharrows and bike work goes in where the paving is going to happen for this project is that correct correct yes no nobody nobody likes to see a new pavement torn up mm -hmm. okay great or if there's a way to just paint the sharrows while while it's happening that'd be great yes all right thanks that's all i have thank you council member schwab no questions thank you Councilmember Fossey? No questions or comments, thank you. Councilmember Zarlingo? No questions or comments, thanks. Councilmember Vogley? I meant that Paula's question was awesome, that's all. Councilmember Tui? I do have one question for Tom. So on that section of federal, which is great, you're getting that repaved, but across the street from Jackson Elementary, there's a section without any sidewalks and people pull up, park there, drop their kids off, and there's nowhere for them to walk on the 
sidewalk side. So they're just like out in the street. So, I mean, it's only about three houses wide. And I'm wondering if that is, you know, putting in sidewalks there is part of this plan. Uh, it is not, as this is a, a pavement maintenance overlay um, project okay. specifically. Um, but I can certainly uh, pass that information along yeah. to the, the appropriate public works teams. Yeah. Uh, and we can look into that. That'd be great. It's like the only section on the east side of federal that doesn't have a sidewalk and it's right across from the school where people pull in, drop off kids. And it's, it's really, uh, it's a little bit crazy. So I would love to have a sidewalk there. Thank all right. Thank you. That's so all noted, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I have no questions or comments. Clerk, will you please take the roll. Councilmember Kimi? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Plus one for sidewalk continuity. Yes. <laughs> Councilmember Schwab? Yes. Councilmember Coffey? Yes. Councilmember Zarlingo? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. President Sohn Cipher? Yes. We now move to the council briefing agenda. These items come before the city council serving as a council committee of the whole and are likely to be scheduled at a future meeting. Tonight, item 10 is the Everett Police Department study update. And I believe we have Kevin Fairchild here to start us off. Is that true? Uh, council uh, oh. President Stonecipher. Yeah, I think I'll go ahead and if I might uh, just provide a, a couple of comments before I introduce our presenter, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, so um, just by way of history, a little bit for the benefit of some of our, our uh, newer council members, this uh, concept of conducting a, an assessment on the police department was first, first raised back in 2014 as part of the structural deficit advisory team process. And for a variety of reasons um, that the discussions um, in the actual start of an assessment were delayed. Uh, the, the idea was brought back up again in, in 2020, late 2020 and into 2021. Um, the primary purpose for this assessment, um, which is very important, was to conduct essentially a comprehensive review of the police department's operations, our management structure, looking at our staffing and providing some practical recommendations uh, that would allow the police department to continue to provide the high quality law enforcement services that we're providing uh, in the most cost efficient manner. And um, in the scope of the assessment was spelled out in the uh, RFP that was issued last year. Um, that RFP was drafted um, with the assistance of a purchasing department, city finance and council president Stone Cipher and uh, former council member Murphy, who at that time was the uh, liaison uh, for the public safety uh, for public safety at the time uh, were all participants and involved in the drafting uh, of that RFP. Uh, city Council, the full City Council, was briefed on that RFP in June of 2021. Uh, the RFP was then uh, published and put out in 2021 in June of 2021, and the contract was ultimately awarded to Matrix consulting uh, in September of 2021. So the assessment then uh, began, got underway in October of last year. And the RFP essentially outlines four phases of work and that there are some council check-ins along the way. And obviously tonight is our, our first full council briefing. There was a previous um, uh, interaction in phase one uh, with uh, our liaison. Uh, so tonight, I'd like to introduce a couple of individuals. The first one is Lieutenant Kevin Fairchild. Uh, Lieutenant Fairchild has been our um, liaison to the project manager with Matrix and has been involved in all of the, the community meetings and a lot of the data collection and some of the benchmarking and some of the requests that have been, been made for some of that information. So he's here tonight in case there are any questions specific to the police department. And then as far as our presenter, I'd like to introduce Richard Brady. He is the owner of Matrix Consulting and he is our project manager. And tonight uh, his intent is to provide you all with a high level overview of the work 
that has been performed to date. So with that, I will turn it over to Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate the uh, introduction. So uh, President uh, Stonecipher and members of the City Council, I am Richard Brady. I'm the president and founder of Matrix Consultant Group. I lead our public safety practice and I am the um, project manager on this assignment and one of the workers on it as well. Um, I put together a brief slide deck to uh, pro support the overview of the study. Do you pro uh, project that or do I? Looks like you do. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if you uh, transition to the first uh, substantive page. So um, because several of you are new to the council, I just thought I'd give a quick introduction to who we are. Um, our firm's been in existence for 20 years. We provide a lot of different services to local government. We did your public work study a few years ago, um, but our principal core area is public safety consulting of which the law enforcement consulting practice is part of that. We have just since uh, we've come into existence, performed over 400 law enforcement studies in Washington and around the country, as well as a few in Canada. Uh, our experience in Washington includes most of the cities and the county in uh, Snohomish County. So a lot of experience in uh, this part of Washington. Um, our police consulting services are varied they include organization, staffing, and organizational assessments, um, while always um, community-centered policing and 20th century policing have um, been important parts of the services that we provide our law enforcement clients. They've been absolutely critical and centered in the uh, last couple of years. Uh, next slide, please. As uh, the chief mentioned, uh, the focus of the study was to uh, look primarily at things associated with uh, staffing and operations. Um, but included within that are looking at uh, creating or expanding alternative strategies to meet the changing needs of the city. Uh, but also to look at those holistic elements of the department, uh, including leadership, uh, higher recruitment and retention training, policies, first line supervision and the like. Uh, this study came at an important time uh, for Everett. Uh, first of all, it's in the context of the national dialogue about the role of policing in society um, or across the country. But Everett has experienced much change in the last couple of decades. Uh, and as a result, uh, law enforcement work has grown and changed with it. Um, also, uh, in common with almost every law enforcement agency in the country, change has happened alongside um, the interest of uh, new recruits to become law enforcement officers. And so uh, recruiting and hiring uh, has been a challenge for uh, Everett. Um, and you've taken extra steps in the last uh, a couple of years to address that. Uh, but that's become a particular challenge uh, for the city. Next slide. Um, so that what we've done up to this point, I, I think it's fair to characterize that to this point in the study, we have pretty much completed the fact finding associated with the study and in some ways that I'll describe in a minute. And uh, what comes next is the thinking phase of the study in which we take the uh, materials and data an input that we've received as part of this study and convert this into a current and longer range plan uh, for the police department. Um, some of the things that we've done up to this date included uh, extensive interviews uh, within the department, uh, including some time on site. Um, I was there for three days, mostly doing uh, ride alongs with patrol, but also conducting some other interviews as well. I think in all, we've interviewed over 40 people one on one within the department, which has given us a great um, uh, perspective on operations and constraints on operations and uh, uh, issues associated with that. Um, 40 or 50 people isn't everybody in the police department. So we gave everybody an opportunity to provide input to us through an employee survey, which I'll summarize in a minute. Um, while we were in this fact-finding phase, we collected much data on police workloads, 
uh, about staffing and personnel issues associated with um, uh, attrition and with training and with uh, leave and uh, certain things associated with uh, availability of staff. We concluded that um, fact-finding phase of the study with a descriptive summary of the department, which we developed and ran past them to make sure that we had a correct understanding of the organization, reporting relationships, staffing, and operations. Uh, we uh, So up to that point, um, all of that focus has been internally. Um, we've gone outside of the department. We've had a, a few interviews, including council and some other uh, people individually, but a major part of the uh, external input uh, was to have five community meetings uh, within the city that were conducted within about the last six weeks. And I'll be summarizing the input that we received from those community meetings in a minute. Um, lastly, we are involved in a, a comparative survey. Uh, I just call them medium-sized departments in the state of Washington. Uh, which will help us develop a, a peer assessment or a gap analysis of where um, uh, Everett compares to some of its peers in the state, uh, which gives us an, another point of contact uh, in comparison to uh, best practices or emerging practices in law enforcement. Next slide. Uh, so first of all, the results of the employee survey. Uh, we had a phenomenal response rate 160 total responses uh, for 72% of the uh, surveys that were activated. And uh, anything over 60% is a really good um, um, response rate. So we consider 72% to be very representative of the employees in the department. Um, some of the positive things that we heard from within the survey uh, is lots of positive views about relationships with the community and uh, as well as their support from the community, including um, city government. Um, they were very positive, overwhelmingly positive about the support they get from the chief and other command staff. Uh, and they felt that the chief and command staff are innovative and keeping um, in step with uh, emerging best practices and changing changes in policies and procedures that are um, um, now becoming common practices and, and common targets in law enforcement, but uh, you've been focusing on those, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, from before the protests of uh, a couple of years ago. Next slide. On the issue side of things, uh, pretty clearly that uh, one of the most uh, uh, negative uh, sets of questions we asked related to views about staffing and personal allocation, not just in patrol, but in investigations and in other uh, support functions within the department. Uh, it was the number one major concern among employees who responded. And that not only um, uh, came to us in the forced choice kinds of questions that we asked, but also we gave everyone the opportunity to respond narratively at the end. And we heard an awful lot uh, about that. Um, while there are many positive views about uh, command staff, um, the link in the chain at the captain level um, was viewed to be a weakness in respect of communications from the top to the bottom of the organization. And they'd like to see the captains being more visible and more uh, open uh, with uh, staff, uh, particularly in patrol. Uh, Many employees express the need and the desire for increased training opportunities. Uh, I think it's fair to say, though, that that falls in the context in the last couple of years of uh, it's been difficult to get people trained when many of the in-person, most of the in-person um, training opportunities, certainly in 2020, evaporated, and they only started to come back in the second half of last year. Um, training is important. It's hard to get training if you're down staff. And as I mentioned earlier, you've been down uh, a number of positions uh, over the last couple of years, often over 20 positions. Um, while there's been a recent uh, focus on recruitment, uh, similar efforts need to be made on retention to uh, stop uh, or impede employees who had a desire to leave before their retirement age uh, or to go to another department to stay on with Everett. 
I think having said that though, uh, overwhelming support for questions like uh, our morale is good, uh, but also uh, willingness and interest to make a career of being in law enforcement in, uh, in Everett. Next slide, please. So the community meetings, so the structure of them, we had five of them, as I mentioned. Uh, we had three that were geographically focused in Central North and South uh, that were coordinated uh, from the uh, police department. Uh, but we also had citywide meetings, one in Spanish and one uh, held for the business community. Uh, most of them were held in the early evening hours. The business one was held during the workday. We had tremendous uh, attendance and participation within the uh, meetings, uh, generally in the 20 to 40 range, uh, but really high participation rates among the people who uh, uh, virtually came to the meetings and they all were held virtually. Next slide. So the meetings was to get the input from uh, constituents on uh, visibility of police, about uh, the amount of proactivity they had and what they used to it how they used it to address problems in the community, um, how they worked with the community to set priorities in dealing with emerging or chronic law enforcement related issues within the community, um, their responsiveness to identify problems and whether they felt safe uh, in the community as, as well. Um, so we also talked about alternative approaches to policing and that actually was a wide area of uh, of uh, discussion within the meetings. So the next slide. Oh, some of the key themes in terms of the issues. Um, while Mr. Uh, Ryszkowski uh, hit it on the head, um, there was a lot of discussion in most of the community meetings about perceptions of safety. And mirroring what was said earlier, um, most people felt safe during the daytime, but most people felt less safe at night and most people felt less safe in the last few years compared to say five years ago. Um, concerns about the impacts of uh, homelessness uh, on um, the community um, and as that relates to the first point there, uh, but also persons in some sort of crisis, often mental health crises uh, and the perceptions on crime and um, other issues within the city. Um, many participants felt that the police department's response priorities were inconsistent. Um, as we went around the city, uh, especially in the geographical groups, but uh, also and notably in the uh, Spanish speaking group, um, there were perceptions about first of how not lower priority calls for service were handled to uh, being extended in terms of response, which is not unusual. Uh, in Everett or anywhere, um, but also non-response. And we had several people who said that they had a theft or uh, burglary and it may not have been um, um, a lot of expensive items, but it was important to them and um, threatened them. And uh, uh, there were extremely delayed responses and a couple of people who said there was no response. Um, while the ties to the community were viewed to be strong. Um, some people felt that there should be more engagement in neighborhood meetings and other kinds of community group meetings. And that most of the emphasis was on things like Citizens Academy and Youth Academies and things like that. And again, I put that in context of the last two years that a lot of the in-person community engagement was uh, certainly um, not happening and certainly during 2020 and the beginning of 2021. But the department had transitioned those to uh, virtual and uh, still there were many comments along the lines that they should be more involved with smaller groups rather than the, the citywide types of groups. As was mentioned earlier, certainly new state laws have made policing more difficult throughout uh, the state of Washington. And uh, some of these are being addressed in subsequent uh, corrective legislation, but it's also resulted in making some of the problems that were identified uh, more uh, of a problem in the community. Um, generally, uh, there was people who came to the group meetings felt that trust in police has improved in the last year. And, uh, and I think that's because of the more engagement uh, once the 
COVID levels uh, reduced uh, markedly uh, throughout the year. Uh, potential solutions, I wanted to see the police more visible, uh, especially at night through redeployment of personnel. Um, while there was a lot of support for COET and similar community engagement and problem solving programs, um, there was a lot of discussion about the police have increasingly been viewed as being the people to solve any kind of problem in a community and that they should focus more on law enforcement and quote unquote the basics, which includes things like traffic enforcement and things like that. I'm um, getting back to that issue that was identified earlier about um, slow response and non-response. Um, felt it was important to manage expectations on response starting at dispatch. Now, um, the county dispatches you, but um, you have uh, much influence in how uh, people who are requesting service are handled. And many um, dispatch agencies today are um, at least informing uh, somebody who's calling for a request for service, especially on a lower priority request for service, that it could be some time until uh, somebody arrives and maybe giving an estimate that maybe a sergeant could help out uh, with. Um, so that, that's a better form of management of dispatch is really important. Uh, certainly while COVID-19 has driven perceptions of engagement uh, now that uh, COVID-19 levels are lower, at least for now, to double down on programs and program involvement. Uh, discussion about enhanced recruitment efforts uh, can help the police department be more reflective of the community it serves. Uh, much discussion about uh, recruiting more from within the community, uh, but also discussion about uh, how to increase retention efforts within the police department. There was some discussion about providing greater transparency on complaints regarding officers' actions so that um, the department was completely transparent about the number of complaints, the disposition of complaints, uh, and transparent to people making complaint uh, more as quickly as they possibly can. Next slide, please. So the comparative results, those are in progress. Uh, we received uh, uh, five of the six or seven agencies that we've reached out to. Um, some of them are not complete. Uh, so we're uh, still working with the agencies that we reached out to that include Auburn, Federal Way, Kent, Renton, and Vancouver. Um, uh, Tacoma was in that mix, but uh, we've had difficulty getting responses from them. So I think in the next couple of weeks, we'll have complete comparative survey results. Um, some of the high level things that we found out so far, reflecting its density compared to some of those other communities, you've got more sworn per square mile than the other ones, but that's not a huge surprise. But you rank last in the percent of people assigned to patrol. That is pure patrol, people assigned to beat areas, which is an indication of uh, specialized enforcement, enforcement and specialized teams that have been created that exist in larger departments, more than smaller departments. So that's a factor. Um, so interestingly, Vancouver, I think, was the was the next to the last, which is a larger uh, city as well. Um, uh, Everett and Vancouver, the only respondents uh, who currently deploy alternative response like Colette for handling uh, mental health and crisis calls. Um, and that's not just because they're larger. I mean, many small communities now have alternative response units. Departments we're working with as small as 30 sworn personnel uh, often have one or two people who co-respond with mental health and uh, social workers on certain kinds of calls. Uh, only Everett and Washington, Washington uh, Everett and Vancouver have um, community liaison specialists. Most of the other ones, the people who sign a patrol are generalists who do both call response as well as uh, community proactive work. Um, Everett employs a similar percentage to the other units, uh, the other cities, in terms of the specialized units of traffic, gang, and drug enforcement. I think it's a uh, last slide. So what we're doing now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is starting the process of doing the staffing analysis as well as uh, the more holistic elements that I mentioned before of policies, training, recruitment, and hiring. So we'll develop another uh, interim report that summarizes the improvement needs uh, that will lead to the draft and final reports. And uh, those will be done uh, uh, 
about early summer, so probably sometime by the end of June. So that's that's uh, our presentation. Uh, I'd like to answer questions that you may have. Thank you. Let's go down the roll and see which council members have questions. We start with council member Ryan. Thank you. Thank you for uh, putting the uh, preliminary report together. I had a chance to sit in on one of the meetings. Uh, I believe it was for North Everett for about half an hour or so. And I just really appreciated the conversation and uh, folks' honesty with uh, the, how they felt about EPD and how they feel in the community. And, you know, there's a very public safety is like such a vulnerable thing to experience and talk about. So I'm really grateful for this uh, uh, deep dive into looking into things. I had a couple of questions. I um, hope now is okay, but I know that you're, there's going to be a final report coming out soon. Uh, so EPD officers mentioned that they would like to see an increase in training opportunities. Did they specify more about uh, what those training opportunities, like there's like a specific category of training opportunities they would like to see, or if it was just a, more of a general uh, comment? Yeah. Um, well, it was certainly a general comment, but where we did get um, uh, some specific input in both interviews as well as in the employee survey. So they're required by law to get basic training and, mm -hmm. and qualify on their weapons and get that kind of thing. But they, they want to be responsive to the growing need on um, de-escalation techniques, procedural justice, uh, those types of things, as well as uh, more training upon reassignment and promotion those issues were all brought up. So again, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, um, um, difficulties in getting people trained in this environment uh, have been challenging uh, the last couple of years, but uh, that's starting to change now. Uh, I, the other problem though is when you're down 20 or so positions, it's hard to get people away to go to training, even if it's not going out of town, even if it's doing virtually uh, for two to four hours. <laughs> A little under the weather, my apologies. Um, thank you for that. Um, I was also curious too, just uh, you had mentioned about uh, beat patrol versus specialized units and in, in your experience, can you share a little bit more about pros and cons about each approach and if, if there's even like a, a balanced approach or a hybrid approach between both groups and what uh, just what some of the best practices are? Yeah, um, well, th this is the kind of thing that in law enforcement, there's been a pendulum I've been doing this long enough to perceive a pendulum. And uh, it goes back and forth between generalized enforcement and specialized enforcement. And I think right now it's it's balanced uh, around the country. And I think that's reflective of your city as well. The problem here is that when you're down a number of positions, where do you take those positions from? You can't take them all from patrol. Uh, you've taken many of them from specialized enforcement units. So several of them are minimal or suspended. Uh, in order to keep patrol uh, active. So um, it is a balancing act. And as you start to uh, impact uh, positively what has been a high attrition and vacancy rate over the last couple of years, you should better be able to reach that balance. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Schwab. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could you please go in a little more detail on how you selected cities to make a comparable study with? Um, size, uh, first of all, being in the Puget Sound area mostly, um, except for Vancouver. Um, and um, um, we looked at some other factors, including the, the, the ranges of uh, economic factors. Um, they're, they're not a perfect fit at all, but um, uh, we were asked to do a comparative survey and you can't get Seattle in there. You can't get Bellevue or Kirkland and those kind of communities in there. You can't go very small. So it, it was difficult to find agencies to uh, compare you to. And those are the ones that we settled on. Thank you. And then um, another question about maybe feedback or community meetings. I didn't get a chance to attend any of them was a uh, response to property crimes. Was that part of, and you kind of touched on a little bit, was that one of the, the subjects discussed? Um, yes, absolutely. And uh, that was key to the, uh, uh, the perception of um, 
people being victims of a crime and much more common crime than violent crime. And um, feeling that if it wasn't a situation as it usually is the case, that there's no suspect or some is actively going on or mm -hmm. you know who it is or it's in progress or something like that, that um, in comparison to the other things that often happen, especially between the hours of about three and in the afternoon and 11 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. that it's gonna be lower priority. So um, a longer response when you're a victim of a crime uh, is going to be an issue. But what many communities are doing now are managing those expectations so that uh, the person who was the victim was able to appreciate that it was in the context of violent crime responses or lack of personnel or something like that, but it was not a fall through the cracks. But the falling through the cracks issue, even though everybody didn't say it was a couple of people who said it, is, is, is a pretty serious uh, issue uh, from the perspective of the people who were expecting a response. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, my last question, thank you for your time, um, is the issue of staffing. And I know we approved this council, or actually technically last year's council approved um, eight new police officers for this year. And um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's enough. So I wondered if you could address that. Uh, I give us a couple more weeks and we can. We're just going through the CAT RMS data now. Uh, so let me explain a little bit about how we, we do that assessment. So, I mean, adding some number outside of the context of what the call for service workload is and expectations about being able to be involved in proactive activities is key to it. And that mm -hmm. takes a, a lot of data analysis. And we've um, had to, we've requested data a number of times to get um, better information on that. So um, what we have done is we have collected information for the past couple of years on the uh, calls that go into the 911 center, the Snohomish County uh, Communication Center, and uh, analyze where those calls occur by time of day, by day of week, the, um, the type of call it was, um, how long it took them to get there, how long they took to handle the call, in other things, uh, to develop a real detailed portrait of how highly utilized um, uh, police, op police officers assigned to patrol are. Uh, and so typically what we find is that they may have uh, a lot of time to be proactive early in the morning when not many people are awake and needing help and uh, you can solve problems with. But during the daytime hours and early evening hours, they don't have much of it. So, and sometimes that varies by different days of the week, et cetera. So um, we are going into some depth of that because we may find that they are somewhere on the spectrum of where they need to be to have an aggregate amount of proactive time, but it's deficient in some parts of the city at some times of the day. Mm -hmm. So we're, as I said, we're uh, two or three weeks away from finding that. So next time we're before you, we'll be able to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fossey. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, when you're evaluating kind of those needs and calls for service and that triage, uh, are you looking at all or anticipate the 988, a new call line having any sort of impact with the triage of that and the service level need? Yes, we can factor that in because those kind of calls are typically going into 911 now, so we can factor in what those are. Okay. Um, with the uh, ranking last in allotted patrol staffing, uh, is that purely just the staffing level issue uh, or like just the lack of bodies? Why we rank so low? Oh, I. I don't know. As I said, we're just in the middle of the comparative survey. Okay. Uh, so I, I haven't been able to dig into it to sort of probe why or follow up with the agencies Okay. Uh, okay. as well. Because okay. it could be either side of that equation, people or work. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
in any of your i was able to attend one of the the meetings uh was there any discussion um when you were actually talking to the actual staff side of things uh about uh, a desire or need for mental health supports within our own pd for our own staff oh absolutely and uh and that's one of the areas that we're going to be focusing on when i talk about talked earlier about the holistic concepts of policing. Now, if you look at the 21st century policing report and officer wellness is very much a part of that. And uh, every police department realizes that too and is taking steps to address that through staff hours and programs. So we're definitely looking at that. Great, thank you. I look forward to seeing what comes forward. Thanks. Thank you, council members Arlingo. Uh, well, I'd like to thank the other council members for very good questions and helping me see the, the data better so far. I don't think I have uh, more to ask at this point, more, more for me to digest, I think, uh, in the presentation and the stuff we'll hear in the future. Um, I just one comment, I think, especially for, uh, for Chief Templeman, thank you for uh, engaging a third party here to talk both to your force and to engage with the community. Um, I think we're gonna need to see both sides of that as clearly as we can to, to uh, to move this forward and 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 work against the headwinds we're facing now. So uh, thank you on, on both counts on that. Thank you, Councilmember Vokley. Thank you very much. I hope that I, can you hear me? Cause I now can't hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, I hope I don't get interrupted by my kids. You might've seen me yelling at them. Um, <laughs> so thank you again. Um, I do have a few questions. Uh, you mentioned challenges of recruiting and that Everett is having a difficult time. And I know that we have heard that a lot uh, and I know it's true. Uh, so I'm not denying that. Are there many other jurisdictions having uh, challenges as well. It sounded like Everett was the penultimate in challenging for recruitment, but I'm not sure. All, if almost, I... all of, almost all of them. And so it's it not, is. And it's, it's not just the money. You can throw money at the problem and it's not going to help everyone make that decision. Um, so I think there's been a lot that has happened in the last couple of years or the protests and the view of policing uh, in society uh, and at full employment. Even now we're pretty close to that. It's making it difficult as well. Okay, just wanted to make sure that everybody else knew it's not just Everett <laughs> that's having a problem. Um, those are notes. Um, something that, okay, when we originally uh, requested, the uh, Public Safety Committee originally requested to have uh, this happen. Um, it was partially to determine if EPD was properly staffed and if um, if we really are down, you know, 20 FTEs, let's say. And I just want everybody to know you all are working very hard and I also was able to go to a uh, neighbor, one of the neighborhood meetings. And at that particular one, I did hear a lot of, and you mentioned this, Richard, the police are having to deal with everything, everything from stolen tricycles to humongous life traumatic events. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I keep hearing what I think is a biased, a bias of, you know, while the department is down 20, it's hard to do it when the department is down 20 people. Um, if it was correct, you know, I'm hearing that like I should, I'm hearing a bias. So I'm wanting to make sure that either um, that you're aware of it. If, if I'm hoping that you're aware of it, maybe you, yeah. So I'm not sure how, to word that exactly, but um, yeah. Um, so considering properly staffed and workload and the different calls, and I see that you are, you thank you to the other council members who asked all the questions that <laughs> much better too, I might add, um, getting all that data you're just starting on. But if there is enough data that says maybe EPD is right-sized, 
for the amount of work they could do if you took out the calls for you know the mental health and the that is that going to be um an option i guess at the end if if there's really a lot of work that is happening that could be done by a different department not a different police department but a different city department i would like to know about it because <laughs> it is a tough job and they need to not have to go do the things that aren't necessarily police work absolutely that's part of our analysis and but it's it's broader than that so the first question we ask is that for the existing organization can we reallocate the work or the people to free up people to work uh, or be available for higher priority tasks some such as some of the things we've talked about secondly uh can you uh, have that work go to some other entity uh, or be dealt with alternatively more telephone reporting even internet reporting something like that uh, and then lastly as we've been uh, addressing in several of the questions here do you need a police officer to do everything um, it's not just a question of cost although it's certainly partially a question of cost it's also a question of training background and experience and and what's the most appropriate way of handling those calls so all three of those things come into this analysis somebody's playing with my mute button um thank you i really appreciate that and when let's see you were saying that um some of the concerns that the the community members were having um may have been changed because you know we've just experienced COVID, so everything's different and also staffing and being able to go to training um did community members or staff mentioned that um well, pre-COVID, we really loved all of the um, communication that we were getting from law enforcement and the fun things that they do because whatever, but COVID really put a damper on it or is that an assumption that's being made? I, there was some discussion of that. I, I don't think everybody, um, that, that, that everybody wasn't involved equally in the department uh, before COVID either. So um, I think it was more cast when we were more fully staffed, but you've been in this hole for quite some time. So you had to have quite a long memory to realize what it was uh, and or been an employee for quite a long time to really remember that. Maybe it's because I have music going in the background. I want to make sure that you can't hear it. That must be it. So I apologize. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And we have some really, really, really great law enforcement and we've lost a couple of really great law enforcement. So we need to get this right and do well by them. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Tui. Thank you. I wanna thank Richard for bringing this presentation tonight. And uh, I just have uh, two additional comments to make from all the other questions that were brought up. but. First of all, I'm just um, was really pleased to see that our EPD feels supported by the community and their chief and commanders. And I, to me, that was super, super important because that was, uh, I think that's just a great, a great thing that that we need to have happen and needs to be there all the time. And the other thing is, um, and I assume that that I know in our previous studies they've come up. At the end, they've come up with scenarios of what we could work on and do, but I really I want to make sure that we get recommendations. Um, if we can Richard on retention efforts, what we could do, because uh, we have some great um, police officers and we certainly don't want to lose them after all of this training and, and being in our community as long as they have been so. I just wanna make sure that we get some solid recommendations on how we could help with that. Definitely. And that's all I have. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. And for my comments, most of my questions have been answered. Um, the one question that I found a little interesting to me uh, really has to do with sort of this perception of uh, safety versus 
actual safety. I know we always mm -hmm. uh, talk about, you know, crime rates just overall are one thing and then actual how, how people feel about what crime rates might be is another. Um, so I'll be looking forward as we get through the process to hearing about recommendations for how we can change those perceptions if it's possible to do so. I just, I, I, I'm just out of ideas on that. Um, and then the other question I have has to do with the finding that we have the one of the lowest levels of patrol officers. So, um, and I, I guess I just maybe don't understand. I'm a numbers person. So I probably have to see the data, but I'm just curious what, where, how that has comes about. Are we are we lower staffing overall, or are we deploying our staff in different ways? Well, it's it's percentage. It's not numbers in the comparative survey. So mm. as I said earlier, that's something that we've got to uh, look at the data more once we get all of the comparisons in, but. There could be a lot of reasons for that. Uh, so hold on. The pers getting back to your other comment about perceptions, um, you know, I, I think if it ever was the case, today is not the kind of environment where you can tell people their perceptions are wrong, um, right. and that if if there's widespread perceptions that may not be supported by the fact, you still need to help support people in. Um, in those uh, feelings of lack of safety, whether mm -hmm. through deployment, more community meetings or other things that you can do to make people feel safer. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, well, great, thank you very much for being here and uh, we will look forward to our next uh, briefing from you and um, I appreciate your helping our department kind of sift through a lot of this, figure out uh, where we stand and what kind of recommendations you can come up with for us. Well, thank you for having me here this evening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, that brings us to the end of our uh, agenda. We do have an executive session that we will recess into. It's expected to last 40 minutes with possible council action to follow.
uh, from its executive session. And at this point, I'd like to call on City Attorney David Hall. Thank you, Council President. Um, we're asking for a motion to authorize the mayor to execute a settlement with Jay Taylor in the amount of $356,160.44 um, to resolve uh, the death benefits owed to him um, related to the death of his wife, Officer Sonny Taylor. Do I hear a motion? Council Member Zarlingo recommends we authorize the mayor to uh, proceed with this settlement. Council Member Tui seconds that motion. We have a motion and a second. We'll go down the roll to see if we have any questions. I start with uh, who's first tonight. Council Member Ryan. No questions or comments. Thank you. Council Member Schwab. No questions or comments. Thank you. Council Member Fossey. No questions or comments. Council Member Zerlingo. No questions or comments. Council Member Vogley. Uh, love to the family. Council Member Tui. No questions or comments. And I have no questions or comments. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Tui. Yes. Council Member Ryan. Yes. Council Member Schwab. Yes. Council Member Fossey. Yes. Council Member Zerlingo. Yes. Council Member Vogley. Yes. President Stone Cipher. Yes. Uh, that brings us to the end of our agenda. If you'd like to provide comment, we encourage you to provide your comments in writing before next council meeting. Uh, you can get the form on the city website. You may also provide written comment via email, or you may uh, ask request to provide a public comment at the meeting, calling. Uh, you, you can join the meeting next week by calling 425-616-3920. The conference ID is 673-732-066-POUND. And with that, we are adjourned.